All right, hello everyone. We're uh, looking at lesson 4.1, inverse functions. These are the three topics that need to be covered. We're gonna identify one-to-one -one functions or when a function is one-to-one. -one. We're going to determine if two functions are inverses of each other. And we're going to practice finding the inverse of a function. We're going to be doing this one both uh, finding the inverse of a function given its equation and finding the inverse of a function given its graph. Now, um, just some slight background or maybe to review some things you probably have already seen before regarding finding an inverse. Um, a common phrase <clears throat> for those that remember, is switch x and y. So a problem you may have done before in, uh, say, a, a Math 1010 course or a, or a previous algebra course would be find the inverse of maybe a linear function y equals 3x minus 2. Well, um, first is, you know, using these simple set of directions, switch the place of x and y, so the inverse would be x equals 3y minus 2. But we want to end up with y equals and not x equals, so we, we solve this equation there for y. So we're going to add 2 to both sides and then divide the whole thing by 3 so this was the original equation that we started with and that's the inverse I'm sure you've seen something kind of like that and we're gonna we're gonna build off of this knowledge and take it a little bit deeper now that we have a better understanding of, of what a function is and domain and range and introducing some new topics uh, specifically here one-to-one -one. so one-to-one -one functions So um, going back to the definition of a function that we talked about uh, back in chapter two, a function is a relation where each input has a unique output and it had to pass the vertical line test to be a function. So now we're going to take a subset of functions or a smaller group and say, okay, which of the functions we've seen are also one-to-one. One. Now here's here's the math textbook definition. Um, if A does not equal B then F of A cannot equal F of B. So, uh, like I've said before, uh, oftentimes it's hard to understand a technical uh, textbook definition. So, here's an illustration of this property. Actually, you know, let's start with a non-example. So, um, A and B are X values. So, let's say I have A and B. And it's obvious here that A doesn't equal B. All it's saying that if we have two different inputs for A and B, then we have to have two different outputs. And I know that sounds similar to the definition of a function, but it's, it's slightly different. So let's say we have this output and this output. 
So the input of A right here gave us this output, F of A. So this would be F of A. This output of, or input of B right here gave us this output, F of B. So first of all, this is a function because it passes the vertical line test. And according to this definition, it's one to one. Now, I know you're still probably very confused, so let's put another example side by side of a function that is not one to one. So let's use the same two inputs, A and B. So let's put A right here and B right here. Now, let's say that if I use an input of A, I get an output of F of A. And then an output of B gives me F of B. And let's say that this is one of our typical parabolas. Now what do you notice about these two examples? F of A is right here on the y-axis. F of B is right there on the y-axis. Those are obviously two different points on the y-axis, so they're two different outputs. But here, F of A and F of B are the exact same. So even though we could state that A does not equal B, F of A actually equals F of B, but it's not supposed to equal. F of A and F of B are not supposed to be equal, so this is not one-to-one. -one. So it's a function because it passes the vertical line test, but it is not a one-to-one -one function. And what we are trying to focus on in section 4.1 are one-to-one -one functions. So there's a very easy test to perform on the graph of a function to determine if it's one-to-one. -one. It's called the horizontal line test. So we're familiar with the vertical line test. That can test a relation to determine if it's a function. So if you draw a vertical line through this function here, or through this relation, we can determine it's a function because it passes the vertical line test. Same with this one. If we drew vertical lines through this relation, we can determine it's a function. Now, horizontal line test. If I draw a horizontal line through this function, the horizontal line hits the function more than once, fails a horizontal line test. Therefore, not the function is not one to one. It's still a function because it passes the vertical line test, but it's not a one to one function because it fails the horizontal line test. So, um, one of the things you'll be doing on your Alex assignment is looking at different pictures of graphs, looking at different types of functions, and it could be given graphically, it could be given in the form of uh, sets of points, um, and you're going to have to determine if those functions represent one-to-one -one functions. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> Determine if the function is one to one, and they may give you a few different graphs to look at. So let's come on back. There it is. This is a function because it passes the vertical line test, but would this be a one to one function? And we're simply performing a horizontal line test on this. So drawing a horizontal line right through here, for example, that horizontal line hits the function definitely more than once. So it fails a horizontal line test. 
So it's not one to one. Okay, they may also, rather than giving you the uh, picture of the graph of a function, they may give you the equation. So maybe part B, what if the equation of the function is given? f of x equals x squared plus 1. Um, what they're assuming is that uh, you can recognize, hey, x squared plus 1 and this is something you would visualize in your mind, or, or perhaps you could graph it if you want, but x squared plus 1, uh, the plus 1 is outside the function, so it's a parabola that's been moved up one unit, and uh, a parabola that's symmetric to the y-axis obviously fails a horizontal line test, so it's not one-to-one. -one. Now, the whole reason that um, a function being one-to-one -one is important and this is kind of getting ahead to this last topic here um, where was it find the inverse of a function but we've, we've kind of already talked about how to find the inverse of a function um, here to find the inverse of a function you switch the place of x and y so Building off of that, um, just so you can understand why a function being the one-to-one -one is, is kind of important when we're talking about inverses, let's say that we had a function that's a parabola, and this is not one-to-one, -one, but let's say we had a point there of 1, 1, and negative 1 comma 1 and 2 comma 4 and negative 2 comma 4. Let's say that this function represents f of x. The inverse we're going to go back to that phrase switch you switch the x's and y's to find the inverse. So all that means is all of these x and y pairs are going to switch. So remember, a coordinate pair is always x comma y. So the inverse, we're going to switch those x's and y's. So this one, for example, rather than the point 2 comma 4, it would be the point 4 comma 2. So 4 comma 2, maybe right there. Um, and this point here, negative 2 comma 4, we would switch the place and have a 4 comma negative 2, which would be, let's say it's right there. Now this point here, 1 comma 1, doesn't switch much. But this point, the x's and y's would switch to be 1 comma negative 1. So what happens is we get a picture like this. So what's the big deal then of this story of being one to one? The function we started with here is not one to one. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So what did that result in with the inverse here? The inverse fails the vertical line test. If, if the original function fails the horizontal line test, then its inverse is going to fail the vertical line test. And the problem with failing the vertical line test is it's not a function. The inverse is not a function. So not one to one means that the inverse is not a function. Now, modifying f of x, let's go back to this picture here. Rather than the full parabola, maybe we just consider the right half of the parabola. So this is x squared if x is greater than or equal to 0. So let's just take the right half of the parabola. Uh, 
So we've got one comma one and two comma four actually. So then we find the inverse. So we're finding the inverse of a function that is now one to one. So this point would be the point four comma two. Let's say that's right here. The one comma one stays the same. So the inverse passes the vertical line test, so it's a function. And that's that's the importance and the idea behind a function being the one-to-one. -one. If a function is one-to-one, -one, then its inverse is also a function. Now, uh, going back to our second topic, our second topic was determining whether two functions are inverses. So that's where we are now. So two functions, f of x and g of x are inverses if two things have to be true, f of g of x must equal x and g of f of x also must equal x. So on an assignment, for example, or if it were a test question and you have two different functions and the, di the directions say uh, determine if these two functions are inverses, you would have to show that both of those are true. If you plug g into f, that results in x. If you plug f into g, that also results in x. Now going back to the background problem that we started with, right here. Um, in, in, in a simple sense, a function is a collection of mathematical operations. Um, a function describes operations done in um, order of operations. Uh, for example, if I plugged a number in for this x right here, then <clears throat> following the order of, op order of operations, I would multiply by 3. And then the last step there would be to subtract 2. That's what this function is saying. In here, I've got the function written out symbolically. But really, this is what the function is. I'm going to multiply an input by 3 and then subtract 2. Now the inverse here is describing operations. If I plugged a number in for x, then what this function is telling me to do is to add 2 and then divide by 3. This is what the inverse is telling me to do. The original function tells me to start by multiplying by 3 and then end by subtracting 2. The inverse is telling me to start by adding 2 and then dividing by 3. What's the relationship between the operations and these two inverse functions here? This one and that one. Um, well, you can see we have inverse operations. I'm multiplying by 3, dividing by 3, or... I'm subtracting 2 and adding 2. So the inverses these inverse functions contain inverse operations in the reverse order. So think about <clears throat> think about what would happen if you start with x. Try to try to follow along with this in your mind. 
if you start with an input x and that could be any number and then you multiply by 3 then you subtract 2 but then you add 2 and then divide by 3 so let me ask that one more time start with any number x multiply it by 3 then subtract 2 then add 2 and then divide by 3 what do you end up with? You started with x, you go through all of these operations, you've just undone everything. You multiplied by 3, subtracted 2, but then you add 2 and divide by 3. If you started with x, went through all of that, you'd end up with x. And that's exactly what this is saying. If f and g are inverses, and you plug g into f, if they really are inverses, then g function contains all of the opposite operations of the f function so all of the operations are going to cancel each other out leaving what you started with which is an input so the example um, just for the sake of ease let's use the example that we uh, were just looking at we had um, let's say that f of x is 3x minus 2 g of x is x plus 2 divided by 3. Now we already know these are inverses of each other because we saw that at the beginning of this discussion, but let's try to prove that using this definition here. So the first thing we'd have to do is show what f of g of x is equal to. What, what does f of g of x equal? It's supposed to equal x. Let's see if it does. So I'm going to plug the g function into f in place of that input right there. So f of g of x is going to be 3 times an input minus 2. That input becomes the g function, x plus 2 over 3. Now, multiplying by 3 and dividing by 3 are opposite operations. They're going to cancel each other out. So then I've got x plus 2 minus 2, the plus 2 and the minus 2. So we can see here that f of g of x is equal to x. Now the second part is we have to show what g of f of x is equal to. So now we're going to put the f function into the g function right there in, term, in place of that input. So it's going to be input plus 2 divided by 3, and the input is 3x minus 2. So this is g of f of x. Now, plus 2 minus 2 are going to cancel. So we have got 3x over 3. The multiplying by 3, dividing by 3 cancels. So we can see here that g of f of x also equals x. Now we're to the last topic, which is find the inverse of a function. So we uh, saw a, a pretty easy example right at the beginning of this discussion with two linear functions. Um, and I wrote this switch x and y, then solve for y. That works uh, to a certain extent if we have functions de um, defined in terms of x's and y's. What we're going to see, though, is function notation, where we have f of x. So um, let's say find the inverse. And the given function is in function notation. And again, let's just, for the sake of ease, use um, a linear function. So I'm still going to use this simple set of directions, switch the place of x and y, but uh, 
you really need to think about f of x as a y. So uh, the inverse would be x equals 5y plus 4. And then we're going to solve for y, meaning get it by itself. So subtract 4 and then divide by 5. Now the only difference from this point on is if we start with function notation, we need to end with function notation. So the inverse of f of x is this notation. It looks like an exponent. It's f with a little exponent of negative 1. That's read the inverse of f. So the final answer would be the inverse of f equals x minus 4 divided by 5. Um, now uh, let's do some more some more complicated examples. Let's maybe move this up to a, a quadratic. So f of x equals x squared plus 4. Find the inverse. Now something that's um, that you need to keep in mind, we, we need to uh, pair this with what we talked about at the beginning of the discussion with, with one to one. The inverse, using this notation, implies that the inverse must be a function, because it's in function notation. Must be a function. The problem with what we've been given here x squared plus 4. If we were to graph this, it's a quadratic function that's been moved up four units. <clears throat> it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, therefore it's not one to one. So the inverse of this wouldn't be a function. And that's a problem. So before we find any inverse, we need to figure out a way to make this one-to-one. -one. So what typically happens is you have to restrict the domain. So I'm going to say f of x equals x squared plus 4 only if x is greater than or equal to 0. What this means is we're not going to have the full parabola like that. We're going to have the parabola only when x is greater than or equal to 0. So it's the right half. So for thinking domain, the domain is from 0 to infinity. And the range is from 4 to infinity. Now we could find the inverse because we have a one-to-one -one function. So again, it's easier to find inverses if we're thinking x's and y's possibly. So I'm going to say, all right, that's not f of x. That's y equals. The inverse would be x equals y squared plus 4. And then we got to solve for y, so I'm going to subtract 4. And then square root both sides. Now you may recall me saying several times uh, in this course, when you use the square root operation to solve an equation, you've got to put plus or minus. We're actually not going to on this one, 
because remember, we want the inverse to be a function. If I had positive and minus in front of that, I'd have two different outputs. I don't want two different outputs. So I'm not going to use a plus or minus, and you're thinking, well, that's convenient. You can do it when you want. You can just kind of conveniently leave the plus or minus off of there. Um, and the answer is no. The reason we can leave the plus or minus off of there is because we set the domain and range. The domain is 0 to infinity. The range is 4 to infinity. The domain is typically <coughs> uh, described as our x values, and the range is described as our y values. Well, what we do when we find an inverse is we switch the place of x and y. So the domain of our inverse function is actually the range of the original function. Now let me repeat that. The way that we find inverse functions is we switch the place of x and y. Well, if x and y describe our domain and range of the original function, if those are switched, then the domain becomes the, the domain of the inverse function becomes the range or is the range of what was the original function. So you can see they've just flipped the domain and range of the original function here and the domain and range of the inverse function here have flipped because we switched the place of x and y. Now, what does this have to do with, with the plus and minus? Well, going off here, the, the graph of a square root, the minus 4 is inside the function, so it's moved to the right 4 units. Um, but if we were to keep the plus and minus, we would say, well, we've got the, the uh, positive part of it and the negative part of it. Obviously, that's not a function, and it doesn't fit our range. Our range is just from 0 to infinity, and that's determined not by the graph. This domain and range is determined by what the domain and range was of this original function here. So if the range is going to be from 0 to infinity, we can't have that bottom piece there. We just use the top piece, and that means we're not using the plus and minus of our square root. We're just using the principal square root or the positive square root. So we got to finish in function notation, but the, uh, the inverse of x squared plus 4, if we're only using x values greater than or equal to 0, the inverse is the square root of x minus 4. Let's maybe uh, do a few more examples here. So find the inverse. And let's say we start with a cube root. So switch the place of x and y and then solve for y. So again, I'm going to think about f of x as y. The inverse, we would start by switching the place. So the y becomes an x, and this x becomes a y. And then we solve for y. We need to get this y all by itself, so we have to get rid of the operations. I'm going to get rid of this minus 3 first. Then I'm going to get rid of the cube root, and then I'm going to get rid of that plus 2. So add 3 to both sides. And then, like I said, i got to get rid of this cube root by cubing. So you can't cube individual terms one at a time like that. You can only cube an expression, so I've got, I've got to make x plus 3 into an expression and cube it 
all at once. And then subtract 2 from the outside of this expression. And finish that in function notation. And just something to keep in mind relating this back to uh, something we talked about a little while ago. If we think about the original function and the operations that are contained within the function, uh, again, if I were to put a number in for x, the first thing I would do is add 2, then I would cube root, and then I would minus 3. So the inverse function should contain the opposite operations in the reverse order. So if we go in the reverse order and then take the inverse operation, I would be adding 3 because I'm, I'm starting with this one and working my way up. Then I'd have to cube instead of cube root and then I'd have to subtract or minus 2. This should be the inverse. And that's exactly what's described here. I'm adding 3, then I'm cubing, and then subtracting 2. Um, one of the more challenging types of inverse problem is with a rational function, and it's, it's something that you are definitely going to have to be prepared for. Um, find the inverse. It's just something I practice and see once or twice. It's not that it's super difficult. You just, you just have to see it once or twice. So let's say that f of x equals x plus 2 over, or sorry, x minus 2 over x plus 4. The same principles apply. Um, we're going to switch the place of x and y and then solve for y. Find the inverse f of f inverse and the domain of the inverse. That's something I think they're going to tack on on Alex and also possibly on an exam. So um, before finding, let's see. Let's just take this one step at a time here. Let's just find the inverse, and then we'll tackle domain of that. So again, we uh, think about this as y. So the inverse would be switching the place of x's and y's. So all of these x's here are going to become y's. So we're going to have x equals y minus 2 over y plus 4. So it's easy enough to switch the place of x and y, but for this particular problem it's not quite as easy to maybe solve for y, because the problem is there's two y's, and we need to get the y's by itself in order to solve for it. So I um, mentioned this I, I think a little bit ago, we, we have an equation now that involves a fraction. This here being the fraction. Uh, most of you indicated that you would rather solve an equation without fractions than with, and this is essentially what we're doing is solving an equation. Um, so one thing you could do to get rid of the fraction is to multiply both sides by the denominator. So now we no longer have an equation that involves a fraction, which is nice. Uh, problem is that we still have the two different y's on opposite sides of the equation. And so after you've gotten rid of the fraction, your next task is to try to get all of the y terms on the same side of the equation. Uh, so we're going to have to get rid of this parenthesis, and we have yx plus 4x. And now I can get this y term over here, and I can move this 4x term over there. Again, just getting all the y's on the same side. So I'm going to have y, x, minus y. So I just move this y term over. 
and then I'm going to subtract this 4x term over here so it becomes negative. So negative 4x minus 2. The reason you wanted to have all the y's on the same side is now that both terms have a y, that y becomes a common factor on that left side of the equation. So you can factor out the y and then the y is multiplying there and the opposite of multiplying is divide. So that becomes your inverse. Like I said, a little more in involved, uh, but definitely something that you're going to want to be prepared for uh, coming up on the exam for chapter four and definitely for the final exam is how to find the inverse of a rational function. Now the, the last thing here is, is not only being able to find the inverse when given the equation. So we were given equations here, we were given an equation here, and we found the inverse um, using algebra. You're also expected to know how to find an inverse um, if you've been given just a graph. So we'll do an example of that. Matter of fact, we, we kind of already did a little bit ago, but I'll show you again. So let's say that we have a graph of a one-to-one -one function. And on that function's graph, we have easy identifiable points. So 3, 0. This one is 4, 1. And that's a, let's see, 5, 6, 7, 7, 3. So we have those points identified on the function f. And the domain of this function is from 3 to infinity, the range is from 0 to infinity. So then in the inverse, actually uses the same idea of switching the place of x's and y's. So if we were to graph an inverse, we would take all of these points here and just switch the x and switch the place of x and y. So 3 comma 0 becomes 0 comma 3 and then 1 4 comma 1 whoops becomes 1 comma 4 and then 7 comma 3 right there becomes 3 comma 7 right there And that's the inverse. <clears throat> Matter of fact, just to uh, compare these a little more directly side by side, let's do 3 comma 0, and then 1 comma 4, and then 3 comma 7, okay, so that's on the graph that we started with. Now, the domain of the inverse you can see here is from 0 to infinity and the range is from 3 to infinity and you can see it's just the exact reverse of the domain and range of the original function. Also something that's that's interesting if you graph an inverse and a function on the same graph they will always be reflections of this line right here yeah, different color. There we go. This is the line y equals x. A function and its inverse will always be a reflection about that line, y equals x. So just to recap, uh, we're now done with section 4.1. You need to be able to determine if a function is one-to-one. -one. You can do that using the horizontal line test. You need to be able to determine 
given two functions if they are inverses of each other. Let me actually let me go back to the beginning. Okay, so determine if a function is one to one, it's got to pass a horizontal line test. So we saw that this one was not one to one because it failed the horizontal line test. This one is one to one. The deal with being one to one is that if a function is one to one, then its inverse is also a function. All right, then we need to, det to determine if two functions are inverses. We need to show both of those to be true, f of g of x and g of f of x both must equal x in order for two functions to be proven to be inverses. And then we talked about actually finding the inverse and we switched the place of x and y to solve for y. And we talked about uh, the uh, relationship between domain and range of a function and its inverse. You can see that here that the domain and range of an inverse you just simply switch the place of x and y so your domain of the function becomes the range of the inverse and the range of the function becomes the domain of the inverse. Um, pretty important that you uh, are comfortable finding the inverse of a rational function also. So that is lesson 4.1.